Well, we're going to have a little fun and a little seriousness today. I always put my white shirt on for my mother. I know some of you guys didn't do that today, did you? Okay. See, my mother bought me um, a white shirt for Christmas for 12 years in a row. 34 sleeve. And I have a 32. And I never had the opportunity or the courage to tell her. So every year I put it in a dresser drawer. Two dresser drawers, white shirts. But I always dressed up for mom. You know, when it comes to Mother's Day, incidentally, uh, moms, you're not getting any flowers today. You give me. And you're probably thinking, you know, I'd rather get a wildered flower than you. But anyhow, you're not getting one today. Sorry about that. But there's a lot of emotions when it comes to Mother's Day. And, um, you know, not being a mother, I don't know what those are. But I know, in talking to my wife, different people, different mothers, you go through a lot of different experiences. And I know sitting right here today, there are those that uh, probably are hurting. Some of you are real glad everything's going okay. Some of you lost your mothers, lost your child. Maybe it didn't turn out like you thought they would. Disappointments, whatever it might be. So first of all, I'd like to share just a couple of uh, funny things that kids say, okay? That, that, that's normal for Mother's Day, isn't it? Funny things that kids say, like, uh, how did God make mothers? Magic plus superpowers and a lot of stirring. So that's how he makes them. He made my mom just the same as he made me. He just used some bigger parts. <laughs> he used dirt, just like he used for the rest of us. Why did God make your mother? Think about it. It was the best way to get more people. <laughs> That's a pretty smart kid right there. To help us out when we're getting born. Mainly to clean the house. <laughs> She's the only one that knows where the Scotch tape is. Why did God give your mother not somebody else's mom? God knew she likes me a lot more than any other kid's mom likes me. Another kid said, we're related. <laughs> what kind of little girl was your mother? I don't know, because I wasn't there. But my guess would be she was pretty bossy. <laughs> <laughs> they say she used to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> My mother has always been my mother and none of that other stuff. What ingredients does God use to make mothers? They get their start from men's bones. Then they mostly use a string, I think. How did your mother meet your dad? Mommy was working in a store and daddy was shoplifting. <laughs> what did your mother need to know about your father before she married him? His last name. <laughs> Why did your mother marry your father? She got too old to do anything else. <laughs> My grandma says mommy didn't have her thinking cap on. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, probably a lot of truth to that. My dad makes the best spaghetti in the world, and my mommy eats a lot. Who's the boss around your house? My mom doesn't want to be the boss, but she has to. She has to because my dad's such a goofball. <laughs> uh, how many of us can relate to that? Mom, you can tell by how she does room inspections. She sees the stuff under the bed. I guess my mom is, but only because she has a lot more to do than my dad. Well, that's a few uh, funny little things. A little serious part, I want to read scripture to you. Mothers, I want to encourage you that God made you for a very special purpose. And uh, Psalms 139, verse 13 through 16, I'd like to read it. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. See, Mom, he made you very special. That was his purpose. 
And no matter where you are in your emotions today and whatever has happened, I want you to know you're a very special per person that God has made for a purpose. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower part of the earth. Think about it. That mother's womb, that little child, purpose of God. He made you for that. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Think about that. God knew everything about that little child in that mother's womb before it ever took place. Think about how important you are. You know, the Bible says children are to honor their parents and to obey them and to love them, to respect them. And this is one reason why God made you for a very special purpose. And I just pray that today, no matter where you may be, the feelings that you might have, that you can take just a moment and say, in spite of all of that, maybe disappointments, whatever, you can say, I am an important person in the eyes of God. I'd like to introduce you to my mother. She, uh, she died 42 years ago. She'd be 113 today. And the reason I'd like to introduce you is because uh, I've seen that look before. <laughs> I've seen that look a lot. The fact of it is, I can remember one day, grew up out on the farm. We had a lot of elm trees on the farm. The branches hang down low. My mom could grab one of those branches, cut it off. She'd have a switch about that long. Man, I tell you what, I could do a dance. Wow. <laughs> Bare legs. But I can remember one day when I was about eight or nine years old, I saw her heading toward the elm tree. And I took off running. And I ran as fast as I could go. I went out the driveway down the road. And I can still hear what she said. I never heard my mother use cuss words. But she said, blank you, Leslie Albert Schussler. You'll come back. And when you come back, you're going to get the whipping of your life. Now, you have two questions, don't you? And the answer to both of them is yes. And yes. I did come back. And I got the whipping of my life. Those words still ring in my ear. They haunt me. You'll be back. My mother. I, um, I didn't think she was very pretty when I was in high school. So I didn't want any of my friends to see her. And um, I was uh, not a good person in high school. And so I um, really embarrassed her. And so when my father died, my mother lived a couple years after that. And she was in the hospital. She was sick. And when my dad passed away, and my brother and I were standing at the casket looking in. I said to my brother, I said, you know, there's some things I wish I'd have said to him, and I didn't get it done. And so I knew my mother, I had to say something to her. And so she's in the hospital. I walked in the room, and I knelt down beside her. And I said, you know, Mom, I said, I want to apologize to you. I said, I've hurt you. And I said, will you forgive me? And she said, of course I will. But I'm sure glad I was able to say to my mom, I'm sorry. I apologize. Will you forgive me? If you have anything you ever need to say to somebody, to a mom or dad, you better get it done. Because you never know when it may come back to haunt you. She was a sweet lady. She really was. But I sure have seen that look a lot of times. Can you imagine what that lady went through raising me? Can you imagine what this other lady went through raising this other son? <laughs> i tell you what, that lady had a job. She had her hands full, I guarantee you. 
Pastor Bruce, I'm glad you got to see your mom yesterday. I was, uh, we went to a pastor's meeting and his mom is in, in the home up there in, in uh, Omigo. And um, we was getting ready to walk in the door. We were side by side, a wide door. His mom was sitting about as far as where I'm at to the back wall. And she was facing the door. I don't think she knew he was coming. And the minute we walked through that door, you should have seen her face light up. I mean, man, like, that's my son. Isn't she a lovely lady? I want to pray. I want to pray for you moms today. And thank God for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every mom that's here today. I know they didn't get a flower, but Father, they got a scripture. And it means so, so much more to them than what a flower would. And Father, I pray for all of the emotional levels that may be here today. Father, I just pray that, that you will help those mothers be strong who sometimes maybe they think that they're weak. And Father, to help them persevere, but sometimes they may want to give up. Father, help them to be the example to their children so their children can look up and say, wow, that's an influence upon my life. Father, bless their lives. Be with them today on this very special day. God, we love them, and we just pray your blessings upon each and every mother that's here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you, Mom. Thank you, Pastor Al. <clears throat> Moms. You're very special. I had the privilege Friday of performing a funeral service for a couple members of our church. She was 19 years old when she got married. Her name was Joanne. She was married for 61 years. In this church in September 2nd, 1962, her husband Harold and her walked down the aisle, and got saved the same day. On September 30th, 1962, they were baptized together on the same day. Two weeks ago, they passed away together within 28 to 30 hours of each other. On Friday, they were buried together. And I sat there and I talked to the family. And I just said, that is the sweetest, most awesome experience that that lady could have. And you, your family, you're blessed. Two days from now is Mother's Day. And you can look at mother and you can say, my mother and my father loved each other. And I am blessed because they passed together. It was a blessing. It was one of the most easiest, it was, was one of the easiest funerals I have ever been able to perform because both caskets sitting right in front of me and they were both very, very godly. It was easy. And it was easy to talk to the, to the kids and the grandkids because they knew what the heritage was. And then, yesterday I did get to go see my mom. And many of you are suffering through the same ways and the same things that I'm suffering through with your mother or your father or maybe a sibling. Is dementia. Um, I went to see her and I took her out to uh, Longhorn Steakhouse in Manhattan. And uh, my mom's doing good for about the first 10 minutes of the conversation. And... Uh, and then she starts asking me about her mother. And she found out that her mother just had passed. And asked me if I would take her to Holton to go to her mother's funeral. And I, you know, was honest with her. I said, well, mom, your mom passed away 20 years ago. Oh, she started crying. And then she goes, when's dad going to come see me? I said, well, dad passed about seven years ago. She starts crying. The same conversation five times over our lunch. 
my heart was broken. Because this woman, although she's struggling mentally, physically, she's fine. And I, I just looked at her and with empathy, empathy, what do you do? So I went back to the nursing home and took her back and, and I talked to the nursing director there and I said, I need, I need some tools. <laughs> Uh, I, I need to figure out how to deal with some of this. And uh, I want to make sure I make her feel comfortable and respected and, and not like she can't do anything. And she gave me some tools to, to minister to uh, patients of dementia. And it was, it, it's going to be good. But I look back at my mom and kind of like Pastor Al, there's, there's things that you did and she, she beat the dog. She didn't wait for dad to get home. She did everything herself. And she raised eight kids and I was the baby of eight. So I think she was tired of raising kids by the time I got around, because I got by with a whole lot more stuff than my brothers and sisters did. And um, I have a, every Sunday at 6 o'clock, every Sunday at 6 o'clock, I give my mom a call. I've done it for the last 40 years, every Sunday. And um, it, it means a whole lot more now than it did 15 years ago. So we just need to remember to take care of our moms to love them and pray for them. Whether we are a mom, we have a mom, or what we need to do for our mothers, we need to make sure that we love them. So, today's myth is this, that God has a blueprint for your life. We have believed that, we've heard that many times, that everything within my life has a blueprint, and God is going to orchestrate that blueprint within my life. And I want to say that that is a myth, because God does not have a blueprint for your life. When we built this building, this is just one section of the blueprints for the building. Now, every day, they would, it took them over a year to build the building, and every day they would come in here and they had this room and they would be going over all these blueprints. They had a blueprint for plumbing, for lighting, for electrical, for structure. They had like 30 blueprints of everything that they needed to go through, and they were going through these blueprints and looking at them and, and making sure that these professional contractors knew exactly what to do and how to do it. Well, it came in, they called me up to the house early one morning, they started working early, and they called me up and they said, uh, Pastor, I need you to come in to the church. Uh, we found a major mistake in the building. I said, oh no. I said, okay, I came in. That wall right there is three feet to, to the right. It's, it should have been three feet further back, okay? So the wall was already up, it was already framed, it was already sheetrocked, and they were getting ready to do this, and, and the builder, instructor came in, and uh, they, they noticed it was off. They said, uh, what do you want us to do? And I said, what I really want you to do is knock it down and make it correct. And they said, well, that would cost us this, this much money. Could we give you a credit for something else to do that? So, you know, I'm, I'm a pansy. I said, sure, whatever we want to do. So about three weeks later, they were building this baptismal. This baptismal is three inches too far to the left. Three inches. They had the plans. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do, but they did not build the building correctly from the architectural drawings. They had a blueprint. They were professional, but they did not live their life according to the blueprints. They did not build according to the blueprints. Now, just because we have a blueprint doesn't mean that we know how to read blueprints. I know some of you work in construction. Some of you have landscaping. Some of you are electrical. Some of you are plumbing. And some of you are contractors where you have to look at blueprints. And you can look at them and you can read the blueprint. But let me ask you this question. In your life, where's the blueprint? Is, do you have a blueprint for your relationships? Do you have a blueprint for your family? Do you have a blueprint for your job? Do you know exactly what you're supposed to do that you could look down at the blueprint and say, I know what I'm supposed to do at this time in my life. This is what the decision I have to make. This is where I have to go to college. This is who I have to marry. This is what I need to do. We don't have that blueprint. So, of course, if a contractor that knows how to read a blueprint, they make mistakes, how much more would we make mistakes in our life? So we do not live by a blueprint. But what we have is we have a game plan. A game plan. Let me read a couple scriptures to you. And it says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In Romans, it says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. So sometimes it gets confusion. There's confusion within our life. The blueprint to the game plan. Let's consider the blueprint. A blueprint contains specific set of instructions that spell out everything in detail. Now, sometimes it would be nice if we had a blueprint for our life. That God would say, this is what you're going to do today. This is what I need you to do tomorrow. This is what you need to eat. This is what you need to drink. This is who you need to marry. And it's all set out in stone. And I say, okay, I'm going to read the blueprint. I'm going to do what the blueprint tells me to do. And I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And my head is always in the blueprint because I'm afraid that I'm going to make a mistake. And if I do not live my life according to the blueprint, then I'm outside of God's will. And then everything falls apart. But we do not live by a blueprint. We cannot live by a blueprint. A builder that can follow a blueprint, he can build anything. Any builder can come in and they can look at a blueprint and they can build the building because they know how to read it. But not everybody can do that. Not everybody shall do that. But a game plan sets forth general guidelines and principles with freedom and flexibility for adjustment as the game unfolds or as the life unfolds. God has given us a game plan. We could use this as a let, let's use a football analogy. Um, uh, a quarterback, he calls the play. He calls a, a uh, 23 right uh, flare, to the, flare to the left. So he, he gets the quarterback, he gets the ball, he comes out, and the, and the receivers are going out and they're making it, but they're covered. They're covered, and he has no place to look. And he's looking, I said, the play, the game plan was for the quarterback to pass to the wide receiver. But the wide receiver has a guy by Bruce Thomas covered him, and he's on like glue. There's no way this receiver is going to get open. So the quarterback looks at that. He could throw the ball in tight coverage. He could. But he's a K-State quarterback. And so he probably does it anyway. No, he, he looks and he, he, he doesn't see him. So he, what he does, he changes the play. In practice, they ran that play a hundred times. And they knew exactly what they're supposed to do. But the quarterback knows what the game plan is. But because he's covered, the quarterback in life has the option to move the ball forward. Whether he has an outlet pass, whether he runs it, he can adjust the play because the play is broken. And in our life, what we have is we have a game plan that we need to move forward, but doesn't mean that we should just get a sack. But it doesn't mean that quarterback can do other things either. That quarterback, although the game plan has changed, that quarterback could run, but that quarterback cannot go out of bounds and come back in because that's the rule of the game. He cannot go. He cannot throw the pass to an illegal receiver. He can't do that. So he'd be a penalty, but he can move the ball forward. And in our life, a game plan means I can make adjustments, but I still have to follow the rules of the game. If I do not follow the rules of the game, I would be wrong. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, unless we understand how it works, we'll never understand what the will is. Now, we all want to be in God's will. When we um, do major things, when we get married, when we buy a car, when we buy a house, when we have important decisions we try to make, we all ask, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for me in this decision? What should I do? So sometimes we go in different areas to find out what God's will is for our life. And I listed a few of them. The first time, we sometimes play the fleece game. You know what the fleece game is? Gideon uh, put out a fleece. God told him to rescue the Hebrews from their enemy. And Gideon said, he said Lord, I don't really know what you do. And, so, and Gideon said, here's what I need you to do, Lord. I'm going to put out some sheepskin. And I want you to make the sheepskin have, have moisture, have dew. But I want all the grass around it to be completely dry. So the next morning, Gideon wakes up and he walks out of his tent. And the sheepskin was wet, but the ground was dry. He said, okay, okay, I, I, I see what you did, God. But I, I, this is some serious stuff. So I'm going to have you test you again. So this time, I'm going to put the sheepskin out, and I want the sheepskin to be dry, but I want all the grass to be wet. So he went to sleep. He woke up the next morning, and it was there. Exactly as, God, as, exactly as Gideon asked God, God performed. 
sheepskin was dry, but all the grass was wet. He said, okay, that was the fleece. And sometimes we do that with God. Sometimes we say, Lord, I need a sign. I need you to do something for me. And if you do this for me, I will do this for you. And sometimes God does that. Sometimes God does allow us to put that fleece out there. But just because God doesn't fulfill what our desire is in the fleece doesn't mean that's what God's will is for your life. We could ask God to do a lot of things. But sometimes God does not answer with our fleece. And sometimes we, we look deep within ourselves. Sometimes we want that inner peace. Before I know it's God's will, I, I want to have complete, utter peace within my life. And the problem with that is, is we have so many things going on in our life that we can have peace about some things, but we live in a very sin-filled, turmoil world that sometimes we are not going to have peace. And sometimes when we are going through an issue that we ask God his will, we are so stressed about everything else. Sometimes we have, have so much anxiety within our life, we never have complete contentment and fulfillment within our life when we're asking God to take care of it. So sometimes we cannot just have that inner peace. But sometimes we play the Bible roulette. You know what the Bible roulette is? As long as I open the Bible and I can find a scripture that matches anything that I want, I can find it and I'm going to use that and I can do it. The old, the old story is, is uh, uh, Judas. He, Judas, they were going out and, and they were trying to find a will. He says, so he opens up the Bible. He says, Judas went out and hung himself. So they found another one. He says, go do the same. So sometimes that some, when we look at scripture, we can't just say, I'm going to pick my favorite scripture. I'm not going to pick a scripture that fits me and I'm going to live my life by a scripture. That's scripture roulette. What we have to do is we have to find what the Word of God says about issues. And we have to follow what the Bible says, not what a particular scripture says, but what does the Bible say about all of these things. And that's when we try to really get confused. When we get confused because we don't know what the Bible says. And sometimes what we have to do is we can't play Bible roulette. We can't just play the game. What we have to do is we have to know what's going on. But here's the catch. Sometimes knowing God's will... It's very difficult. Sometimes it's hard. And sometimes God can even answer our questions. Sometimes God will even give us the desires of our heart. And so we're making a major decision. But yet God has asked us to do 15 different things. And we are disobedient to God in other things. But yet we're disobedient in everything else. But this thing I really want, God. And if I really want this, will you forget about all these others? And what the Bible tells us what we need to do to know God's will is to get into God's word. When we hear the sound of what God wants us to do, to, to find his will. It's not something that's, a, that's mystic. It's not something that's fearful. It's not something that I don't know what to do. It's sometimes as very easy as this. We just had Easter. And our little kids, how many of you guys had Easter egg hunts for your kids? Okay. And most of the times we have Easter egg hunts for your kids, you have the same type egg. And they're either solid egg or maybe they're polka dotted eggs or whatever. But they're all oblong and they all look the same. So sometimes we think God's will is like an Easter egg hunt. And we look for the same thing that everybody else has. I want God's Easter egg will for me. So we all look for the same Easter eggs when we go out for Easter egg hunts. But what if God's Easter egg hunt for your will is not oblong? What if it's square? What if it's flat? What if it doesn't look like an egg at all? So what we sometimes do is we walk right beside God's will because God's will doesn't look the same for me as it does for Steve. God's will for my life isn't going to look the same as it is for your life. Now, the principles are going to be the same, but God doesn't want me to do the same thing he wants you to do. So I look at other people's life like an Easter egg hunt, and I'm looking around and I can't find any eggs because... What God wants for me is not in the midst of a common Easter egg hunt. What God wants for me is different. It's unique. It's set apart. It's not normal. It's different. So when you're looking for God's will, you can't say, well, Javier's will is this. So if Javier's going to do this, this is what I should do. What we have to do is we have to understand God has a unique purpose for your life and my life. Sometimes he does tell us exactly what to do. Sometimes in our life, he says, this is what I need you to do. This is where I want you to go. Uh, he told Hosea to marry Gomer. 
He told Moses and the children of Israel where to camp and when to move during the wanderings in the wilderness. He sent Jeremiah to the potter's house and told him to watch for an object lesson. There's sometimes God sets us apart and does certain things and tells us exactly what he wants us to do. And I am so thankful for that. We get on our knees before God and we say, God, I need your help. I need your direction. And he tells us exactly what to do, exactly where to go, and exactly how to do it. And sometimes that's wonderful. But here's the key. God doesn't care where we work so much as he cares how we work. And God doesn't care where we live. He cares more about how we live. God wants us. He wants to build our character more than anything else. When we look at scriptures, there's some downsides to, um, to the blueprint. Um, the first thing is sometimes it's spiritual side effect of paralyzing fear. Because if I have to live my life by a blueprint, I'm afraid that I'm going to goof it up. I'm afraid that I'm going to fail. I'm going to afraid that it will not do what God wants me to do. Sometimes we get paralyzed. We're paralyzed of the fear because I want to do what God wants me to do. But God sometimes doesn't tell me exactly what he wants me to do in a blueprint. But he says, this is what I need you to do. I want you to move forward in your life. I want you to move forward in doing what God wants you to do. It doesn't have to be perfect. But what I want you to do is do what God has asked us to do. The other spiritual side effect of a blueprint mentality is it tends to turn the focus on the wrong things. Sometimes when we think about God, and God is going to get mad if I don't do exactly what he wants me to do, then I can't do, because I'm, I'm paralyzed, I'm scared, because I'm focused on the, the blueprint, I'm focused on what does God want, what does God want, what does God want, and I'm not living my life because I'm afraid that I'm going to fall, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it right, and God's going to get mad at me because I'm looking down at the blueprint that God has in store, and I have no idea how to read a blueprint. So what we do is we get so scared. So we fall on our knees and we ask God, will you be a consultant for me? What do you want me to do in my blueprint? And sometimes God is saying, listen, it's not about the blueprint. I, I'm not going to be a part-time consultant. I'm going to be a full-time activist. I want your life. I don't want you to just look at a blueprint and say, I'm afraid that God's going to get mad at me if I do this or if I don't do this. God wants you to have a life. He wants us to have it more abundantly. God doesn't want just to sit there and look at what's going on. So, using God's will, how do we express the game plan? How do we allow God to use us in his will? The longer we're at it, the deeper and better of understanding that we'll have of God's will. We call it the comprehension. Let's look at some of the basics of finding God's will. Now, here's where the rubber hits the road. When you're fighting the basics of finding God's will, we all want God's will. But we don't just need God's will on the big things. We need God's will in everything. The first thing we need to know about God's will is that we should obey what we know. Okay? If, if we know what God wants us to do, but we're afraid even to do what he wants us to do, or we won't do what he asked us to do, then we're asking him to give us something else or enlighten us in other things. So the very first basic core of knowing God's will is apply what you already know to be his will. Apply his word already. This helps explain so much why sometimes things don't get done within our life. Because we know it to be true, but I don't like what it says, so I'm going to ignore that part of the scripture. Now I want this part of the scripture. And God is saying, listen, why don't you apply this? And that's why new Christians, is, 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 it, we're, we're all in the same territory. A new Christian comes in, they don't know anything about the Bible, and, and they, 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 they don't even own a Bible. But yet, and they're saying, I just don't know anything about the scriptures. Praise Jesus, okay? You know what? It, just because you don't know anything about it, that means you can apply from a clean canvas. Now, somebody like you or I that, that knows a lot about the Bible, we're held to a much higher accountability. Because if I know it to be sin, and I continue in it, then I'm accountable to that. But here's what new believers, new people that have no idea about the Bible, they open up the Word of God for the very first time, and they, they read it and say, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God wants me to do. So now what they do is they apply that. And then they apply the next step. Everybody's on the same page. We need to apply what we know. And if we apply what we know, God can do great things within our life. New Christians are on the same path as everyone else. The second thing we should know about discerning God's will 
is that we should get the facts. As many as possible, get the facts. Um, we used the scripture last week. It says, Proverbs 19, 3. The foolishness of a man twists his ways, but his heart frets against the Lord. Sometimes we get in our life and we try to twist our way through life to make it more successful for us or maybe to do what we want to do, although God maybe not want us to do that. Biblical faith is not illogical. It doesn't deny or even ignore the facts. What it does, it tells us what we should do. So the third thing we should do about God's, God's will is should think biblically. We should think biblically. God's will is contained in God's word. So here's the problem with Christians, with the church, is we don't know what the Bible says. We go to Bible studies. We read. But to actually know what the Bible says for my life, that is how I will know what God is doing within my life. We have to think biblically. You know, sometimes, remember back, back in the day when the WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? And everybody wear it. It was a big fan about 10 years ago. What would Jesus do? The problem is, they don't know what Jesus would do because they don't know what Jesus did. And in order to know what somebody is needing to do, you need to know what Jesus did. How would Jesus respond? Because we are supposed to be like ones, like Christians, little Christ-like ones. So what we need to do is what would Jesus do? In the word of God is the will of God. The game plan is easy. The game plan is easy because the game plan is in the middle of God's word. It is God's will for all men to be saved. Would you say that's true? It is God's will that everyone to be saved. That means if I'm not saved, guess what? You're outside of God's will. Because God's will is for all men to be saved. Christians, if you know someone is not saved, it is God's will for you to communicate God's will for them. Not in a mean way. Not with a baseball bat, a Bible over the head, beating them up and telling them they're going to hell if they don't get saved. Okay, that is mean. My job is to communicate God's will for somebody that does not know it. And God's will for every person is to be saved. God's will is for every Christian to live a Holy Spirit-filled life. To be filled by the Spirit. To be loving, to be kind, to be gracious, to be honoring to everyone. That is God's will for our life. Now, when we live outside of God's will, sometimes we have sin within our life, and then we have sin within our life, and then something big takes place. Something happens. I need God. Here's what God does. God forgives, and God moves. God does not hold you to this blueprint. Say that we live by the blueprint. Say that our life lived by that blueprint. But somebody that in your life, they're not living by the blueprint. And somebody that's carnal, that's a believer, gets married to somebody that's not a believer, but that believer was supposed to be your son's wife. But now she's already married to somebody else, so the blueprint that you thought God had for your life is all goofed up and whole world of marriages are messed up because one time in one person's life somebody did not follow the blueprint so the whole world is in chaos because somebody broke the blueprint or maybe you sinned or maybe your child went away and it's not exactly the way God has blueprinted your life or you blueprinted your life so does that mean my life is over? Does that mean I can't be in God's will because I broke a blueprint? No, we don't live by a blueprint. God loves us. And here's what he does. He shows us this. I want to give you direction. I want you to make your own choice. I don't want you to be a robot. I want you to make your own choice. I want you to love me because it's your will. I want you to honor me because you love me. I love you. And I want you to honor me. I want to give you a game plan. The game plan is this is the internal destination that I have in desire for you. I want to orchestrate things within your life. I want to give you the very desires of your heart. I want to give you things that nobody else can give to you. But it's not a blueprint. It's a game plan. It's moving forward for the cause of Christ. And how we understand the game plan within our life. As Christians, we have to get into the word. We have to know what the Bible says. If we do not understand what the Bible says, we'll never make it. We need to master the basics. Mastering the basics, it just means fundamentals. Knowing the fundamentals. 
If we do not understand the fundamentals, we will never get to understand God's will. If you're an athlete and you do not understand the fundamentals, you'll never make it to college ball. You'll never make it to high school ball. You have to understand the fundamentals. In our spiritual race, if we do not understand the fundamentals of God's purpose within our life, what does God say? And if we understand this is what God wants us to do, we should do everything within our power to get to do, getting to do what God has called us to do. And here's the thing. When we start doing the fundamentals, doors open. The will of God is not a mystery. We understand in the word of God what the will of God is. And if we start open up our lives to understand what the Bible says, and we say, okay, I'm going to apply that, what happens is the will of God starts opening up. We start understanding what he wants. We start understanding what sin is. We start understanding what sin does. We start understanding what that could cause within my life. And because we want to get closer to God, and we want to understand God's will, the, the, the stuff, the garbage, the chaos of life is behind us because we're living in God's will. And it's easy to see God's will when we're outside of the garbage. But when we're down here in the garbage, when we're down here eating this garbage of life, and we say, God, what do you want me to do? But we're not touching the Bible. We're not praying. We're not going to church. We're not doing anything. What happens is we cannot see God's will because the junk of life. And we as Christians, we're called to a higher standard. We're called to do God's work. We're called to do God's will. But how do we do it if we don't know what it is? Sometimes we need to get, quit looking at the Easter egg spiritual mentality. That my will is like everybody else's will. That God is going to do everything within my life and all I got to do is stay rigid to God and do exactly what he wants me to do and, 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 and everything will be fine. But you know what? He gave you a volitional will. He gave me a will. That's scary. Because that means I make choices. I am not rigid. I am not under a blueprint and I'm not worried that if I make a bad mistake that God's going to hate me and my whole life is going to fall apart. That means he's going to break me. I'm going to ask God to confess. I'm going to ask him to forgive. And he is faithful and just to forgive all of our sins. And he's going to raise us up. It doesn't mean he's going to fix the blueprint and put our life exactly the way it was. But he is. He says, I'm going to give you a game plan and I want you to go forward on this game plan. So, knowing God's will is very simple. It's knowing God's word. Knowing God. Following after him. Everybody in this church has a will of God. Now, many of us uh, are trying to follow after God's will. Many of us are searching for God's will. But what we have to do is we have to get back to the basics. And say, this is God's word. Let me get into it. Let me find out what he wants. Now, I may not like what he wants me to do. But that's still God's will. Sometimes we have to go through life. Sometimes we have to go through pain. Sometimes we have to experience some unpleasantries to do what God truly wants us to do. But here's the greatest thing. When we experience it, moms, when you experience success, when you see your kids grow up, when you see your kids maybe fall away and they come back to God, you experience what God wants for your life, it gives you peace. It gives you happiness. <laughs> we joke about this all the time in, marriage, in family counseling. God didn't give us the, the manual to raise kids. When you're five months old, six months old, seven months old, you do this, you do this, you do this. Some, we just dive in. Hopefully when they're 18 years old, they're smart enough to leave the house, okay? We just want them gone. That's all we want. We just want it to happen. You know, it's, it's funny. I mean, you go to graduations and next week's big graduations. Some was this week as well. But um, the guys, the men, the dads, were sitting there, yes, it's over. They're done. They graduated. Give them a high five. And the moms are over there, <laughs> Just bawling her eyes out. I said, what are you bawling for? They're going to college. They're out of the house. We get free time. We don't have to pay for everything. And, and the moms are over there just bawling their eyes out. And I just don't get it. And it's just opposites. They just, this different mentality. The same plan. Moving forward. They didn't give us a blueprint to raise kids. What we had to do is we have to make our decisions. Love them correctly. Use the Bible within their life. And say, our job is to move forward. Our job is to be a follower of Christ. Our job is to apply what we know. Our job is to get back to the basics. Be fundamentalist. 
In other words, what does the Bible say? And take the Bible at face value. We can know God's will when we're not afraid of God's will. And when we know God's will, what we can do is we can say, Lord, what's next? What do you want me to do here? I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've tried to follow after you, and what's next? And sometimes he's going to give you a clear answer. Sometimes he's going to give you a scripture. Sometimes he's going to make a song come on the radio or a sermon that you're going to hear. Sometimes it's a conversation that you have. Sometimes it's a, a divine appointment that God puts within your life. There's something that you needed that God gave to you through a conversation, through a person, through a song, through a sermon, through just some weird act that God gives you that answer. But don't take a answer and say, this is God's will because somebody said this. It's God's will when the word of God applies to it. Because let me tell you, it's never God's will. Ever, listen to this. It's never God's will to go against God's word. Never. Okay? Such as this. I think... I want to date somebody. Well, Bruce, you're married. Yeah, but I, I think she's hot. Well, Bruce, you're married. I, are you sure, God? God's will will never go against God's word. Got it? So if, God, if a passion, a situation, a circumstance... He's telling you to go against what God says. Guess what? You're listening to the wrong voice. The right voice is God's word. The wrong voice, contrary to God's word. You can do God's will by knowing that simple fact. Never go against God's word to know God's will.